Good morning. I'm Kevin O'Connor, and welcome back to Ask This Old House, where we are constantly working on solutions to problems around your house. And today, we've got a couple good ones for you. The first one has to do with an uncomfortable entryway. We heard from a homeowner who has an old, thin door that isn't insulated, and it's also leaking cold air around the perimeter. So Tommy is going to take me on a house call, and we're actually going to swap out that old door for a new one that is insulated, that has weather stripping all around it, and we're even going to add a little additional insulation around the jam. Now, it's not that big of a project, but it's going to make a big difference for this homeowner, and it's going to save him some money on his energy bills. Hey, good morning, Roger. Hey, Richard. Good morning, Kev. Whoa, what is this thing? What's going on here? Kevin, this is a model that's going to show us one of the noisiest plumbing problems you can have in your house. And how's it work? Well, that's the problem right now. It's broken. We're working on it. We'll have it done when we get back. <laughs> All right. So, noisy pipes, huh? Let me guess. It starts with Richard in a basement. Today, the problem is water hammer. You've all heard it. Someone shuts the water off in the house, and the pipes bang. It can be annoying, and also can be bad for the pipes. In a house like this, the water comes in from the street, right here through the water main, through the water meter. Now, it works its way back through the building, and it goes and feeds all the fixtures upstairs right here. But it also feeds the wash machine right here. Now, any time you have a wash machine, inside of this, there's a valve called a fast-acting valve. A sensor inside the washer says, let's fill the drum. Now the water's coming through the pipes, coming through the pipes. When the valve closes, it closes fast. What happens to the water? It hits a closed valve. Now all the inertia that's in that water now wants to vibrate and sort of work its way back through the piping system. And any pipe that isn't secured will want to move. Now through the years, we've tried to deal with this. In the 50s, when this house was built, this is how we dealt with water hammer. Tees are cut into both the hot and the cold side. A half-inch copper line comes up here with a cap at the very top. Now this forms an air chamber. When you first fill the system, air stays here and water is right here. Now when that valve closes suddenly, all that energy that's in the water can come up this way and be absorbed against that air charge like a shock absorber. But over time, the air that's in that chamber can get absorbed into the water and they become ineffective. Today, we have a different solution. For the last 23 years, the banging is driving us crazy in the house. Whether it's a sink here or the dishwasher in the kitchen or the washing machine in the basement. I came just in time, 23 years. You betcha. <laughs> can I hear it? Sure. Oh yeah, try it again. Try again. Sounds like it's coming from inside the wall here. Now we've got an access panel here, Harvey. Let's see what we got inside. Okay, Harvey, what we're looking at here is the back side of the bathtub. You can see the tub right here. Here's the overflow for the drain. And here's our hot and cold piping. Now, anytime I think about water hammer, I think about pipes that aren't secured properly. So I shake this around. The, the cold's not too bad. And the hot's pretty bad. And what I could do is just secure this pipe, and that'll help the pipe right here. But these pipes also go underneath the floor. Now, is this where you always hear the noise? Yes. All right, so this access panel might be the perfect place for us to install a shock absorber right there. When I say shock absorber, what I mean is this. It's actually called a water hammer arrester. Okay, we're going to cut them into the copper water lines, and we'll have two of them, one in the hot and one in the cold. we run along a cutaway, and inside you can see that there's a rubber diaphragm in the middle. And on this side, we have water. On this side, there's an air charge. So when that water is moving through the pipe, there's a lot of inertia in that water. Instead of rattling the pipes, it's actually going to push that diaphragm back and forth until all the energy is dissipated, nice and quiet. Now, what I've done is I've turned off the water and drained down the system. Now I'm ready to cut those pipes. Now, I like to clean the pipe before I cut it. It's a little bit easier. I'm using this emery cloth. The water hammer arrestor is going to connect into this T, and the T will solder into this hot water line. So before I cut it, I want to mark it. Right there, and right there. Good. I use a terrific little cutter called an imp to allow me to get into tight spaces like this. Get it onto the pipe and just tighten up the thumb screw. Now I could cut this with a hacksaw blade, but a pipe cutter makes a much cleaner cut. Good, there's one. So I'm just making the upper cut to allow for that T to fit in there. Now we work on the cold side. Good. Apply flux to both the pipe and the fitting and connect it. And same for the cold side.
Now we're ready to saw. Now on the threads to the water hammer arrestor, I've applied a little Teflon tape, and now we're ready to thread them into the tees. I use an open end adjustable to tighten them up. Do it. And now the cold. Okay. The water hammer arrestors will take care of the banging, but I really don't like this pipe moving around this much, the hot. So I'm going to secure it with a clip. Good. All right, access panel's in. Let's give it a try. I'll listen right here. Open up full and shut it off fast. Try it again. What do you hear? Just water, as it should be. Excellent. Thank you, Rich. My Thank pleasure. you very much. You know, when you have these troubles, don't wait 23 years. Give us a call. We're glad to help. Well, actually, my boiler needs attention. Yeah. And the, the dishwasher also yeah. is leaking. Yes, yeah, send us an email, Harvey. Love you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not nice. Always going to email us. He was a good sport. So throughout the entire house, how do you decide where to put a water hammer arrestor? Well, it really depends on where the noise is coming from. If I had a single quick-acting valve in the basement, like that washing machine valve, and that was the only place the noise was coming from, I would put it right near the washing machine. Right. But this was different. Any valve that was open to close in the whole building was causing that noise upstairs in that second floor bathroom. This was really a case of improper plumbing. And that water pipe was run underneath the bathroom floor. It wasn't supported with clips like this, so it was just banging against the back bottom of the floor. Okay, so we didn't have clips, but you said it was caused by any faucet throughout the house. So in that situation, where do you put the arrestor? I wanted to get the source of the noise, and that's right up inside that access panel behind the bathtub. Perfect. Gotcha. And if you weren't so lucky to have an access panel like that? Well, I would have gone underneath the vanity sink, right, five feet away. Okay, that'd be good. And so this is sufficient, just this little device? It is. Let me show you this demonstration. I think it'll really become clear to you. Let's pretend this is our second floor bathroom sink right here. Gotcha. Okay, and here's a water hammer arrestor. I'm going to turn it off. So that means this will not be working. Right. Now, normally, between the second floor sink and the basin, there would be 50 or 60 feet of copper pipe going down inside the wall. Yep. So instead of straight pipe, we just have it coiled up inside here, unsupported. So this represents the run-up pipe that would go between basement up to the second That's floor. That's right. We've just got it all contained. So now when I open up this faucet, yeah. the water's going to move through all that piping. Now I shut it off. Oh, there okay. it is. Do it again. Boy, there's no mistake in that hand. Right. So now, if we open up this valve right here. So now this is basically the shock absorber you've installed. That's right. So now it's going to work. Watch what happens. Close it off. Oh, that's nice. Isn't that something? So hearing is believing. All right, guys, this one's really interesting. It has a solar panel, it has circuitry, and it even has a white gear down there. Mm -hmm. But here's a giveaway. Green plastic top and a metal hook. Huh. What is it? I know exactly. What it is. Yeah, I, I didn't <laughs> think that was interesting at all. <laughs> Actually, you got a guess? Give me that thing. Yeah, I got a guess. I know exactly what it is. It's going to solve so many problems. Because, yeah. you know, when Jonathan Bob invented the Bob, uh, it didn't actually plumb up the way he expected it to, right? <laughs> oh, you're oh talking gosh. about the plumb bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem with the plumb bob is it only tells you if, if things are plumb, but it doesn't tell you if things are flat or level, straight. Level? Or that, too. Yeah. It's supposed to. <laughs> well, this thing tells you all of that stuff. It tells you if it's plumb, if it's flat, if it's something because it shoots out this optical are you done? eye. Are you done? Huh? Good night, right. John Bob. Yeah. Oh, good night, Mary Lou. <laughs> you know what? Christmas time is here where we run all the Christmas lights on the tree. Well, this is a cordless, cordless, get this now, yeah. tangle-free <laughs> Christmas light. Wow. Stores energy in the day, mm. lights up at night. Automatic. Oh. Don't trip on any wires. They don't get tangled. Just hang them all over your tree, all over your house. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Nice look, too. Yeah. No electricity. <laughs> it's the season, huh? Well, this little photo stuff can come in handy. Hang this on your rear view mirror. And you're driving around. Think about the energy that's stored here. It can be 9, 10, 11 gigawatts. <laughs> Just all this power sitting there. So you're driving. You never know what you want to have a little specialty drink. You throw anything in here. Banana, raspberry, some mango. Where are you getting it? Ooh. Mango. Specialty drinks. Where are you getting, uh, little where are you getting all the fruit? Well, you carry it in your glove compartment. <laughs> well, I suppose I should have showed you guys this ahead of time. Well, and Richard, you were almost close. Really? This actually takes the sun's rays, powers that little white gear I showed you, and when you hook it on a plant... It holds it up plumb. It doesn't hold it up plumb. It, it turns it, it very, very slowly. So instead of you having to climb a ladder and move your hanging plant, it rotates so you get growth perfectly all the way I was going to say that. Good night, Roger Bob. <laughs> <laughs>
So here's the door we're going to replace, and it's a pretty good time to do it. You can see the homeowner's got several projects going on. They have blown in insulation into these walls, and they're in the middle of a new siding project. This is actually going to get all brand new clapboard, so that's going to look nice. And it's a good time to change out this door, which doesn't look that good. Actually swollen up a little bit as well. And it's not a very good door when it comes to insulation, is it? Well, the door itself, the styles and the rails are a good inch and three quarters thick, and that actually is pretty good insulation. But the panels are thinner than the styles and rails, and especially where the panel meets the style and rail, it's only about that thick, so very little insulation. It's going to be a cold door, and then up here he's got two glass lights, and these are just single panes of glass, so that's no good for insulation either. Right. So this is going to get replaced, and you have picked out an alternative for us? Right, we're going to replace it with this fiberglass door. Start right down here, it has an aluminum threshold. Mm -hmm. Now the door is actually made out of one piece of fiberglass. It's stamped to look like a panel door. You can actually see the wood grain and the styles and rails. There's actually little seams there. So the illusion is that these are all separate pieces, but essentially just one big piece. Right, and it has a foam core in it, so it's a very efficient door. All right, foam in the middle, but obviously some real wood on the perimeter, right? Right, you need a good backer where you mount the hardware. And on this side of the door over here, where the hinges are, you want to be able to screw that into the wood. Okay. Also, two lights. Two lights of glass that are insulated, very efficient. Dual pane right there, and I notice you've got some weather stripping around the uh, perimeter. Right. The weather stripping comes up both sides and across the top, and it's, it actually compresses when you close the door into it, making a nice tight seal there. And so that is built right into the jam, which is pre-primed, and the whole door is pre-hung for us. Right. So all we have to do is pop out the old one and put in the new one. All right. Now we're ready to cut the jam out using a reciprocating saw. I'm going to cut the nails. Right there, there's one. Not too much holding that in place. Nope. Okay, jam the bar in there, just open that up a little bit. Yep. How's that? Pretty good. That's it, Kevin. Cut some of the plaster away from the jam. You get it? Yep. All right, let's close the door. I think we're ready to pull it out. Let's grab a couple of bars. Put the hook in, but don't put it in too far. Just a little bit and work it out. Ready? Oh, yeah. This side's free. Okay, pull it right down. Threshold's going to stay. That's all right. We'll get it later. Okay, right there. Step. Okay. All right, I'm just going to get the bar into one of these corners here. Let's just see if we can pry it up. That's easy. Okay. Now, when we put the new door into the new opening, we want to set it on a level subfloor. And this subfloor is not level, and it's also crooked. Not surprising with an old house? No. But we also want to raise the entire door up about a half an inch. Why is that? Well, the new threshold is actually thinner than the old threshold. And we want the door, when it opens, to clear a carpet or a rug if they should put it down on the floor. Okay, so how do we raise it up and make it level? A couple of shims across the front? Well, we could shim it, but I like to take a piece of 2 by 4 like this, put it across the opening, mm -hmm. put my level on it like that. Now I want to just shim my 2 by 4 make it level. So this is obviously too big for the opening. You're going to scribe this? All right, I'm going to put a mark right here, half an inch down from the top, onto my 2 by 4 because that's how much I want to raise the door. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to set my scribes from the subfloor to my mark. Mm. Tighten them up. And I'm simply going to scribe right across. Don't push down. Now I just scribe it following the subfloor. Just going around that shim there? Yeah. I'll just connect the dots afterwards. I cut along that line with a saw. Now I cut two of these filler strips, one for the back and one for the front. And did you uh, scribe each one independently? I did. I put it down. Let's check a little level, see how we did. That's nice. good. Now we'll just nail it in place. Now I cut a strip of this self-sealing membrane that will flash underneath the door, sticky on the back. 
If it gets penetrated, it will seal on its own. So we peel this off. And we want to go about two inches past the opening, Kevin. Stick it on this piece down below. And keep it tight. Stick it right to the wall. Okay. Now we're going to try to bend it into the opening. All right, now we want to cut it right here in the corner, but hold on to the piece after we cut it. Okay? Got it. Got it. Now, just let the front edge slide down. Okay, now the top edge, I want to roll it back on itself. And why are we rolling it back on itself? going to create a little tube oh. as a seal. So this will stick right to the bottom of the new threshold? Right. Put a little piece in each corner. All right, one more thing I want to do before we put the door in. Run a nice thick bead of caulking right here in the corner. Now go right in, now right across the front, right in front of that fold that we made. There you go. A nice glob on the other end, too. Fill it right up. All right, those two pieces of scrap with it just screwed on the face of the jam. That's actually to hold the door from falling through the opening when we put it in. But it also will hold the door flush with the exterior wall. That's a nice little trick. All right, now it's nice and flush with the wall. I need about a three-quarter inch space on each side to put it in the center of the opening, so you got to come to me a little more, a little more. Okay, right there. Check your side. Three-quarters right on. All right, let's check the threshold for level. That's pretty good. All right, I'm going to put a shim in here, and I want you to put a screw right through the shims, but pre-drill it first. Okay, that's good. Nice countersinking bit there. Nice big long screw. That's a three and a half inch deck screw, so it's an exterior screw. Okay. Yep. Now with the threshold level, we're ready to plumb up the hinge side of the door. And to do that, we're gonna use this level right here. So we'll tack on the bottom. Right, now the top's gotta to go towards you a little bit. All right, back it off a little. All right, let me get some shims in here. Tap the shims in. Screw this guy off too, Tommy? Yeah, drill right through the shims. Okay, countersink. Switch bits. Screw. Good. Okay. Right. Now we'll shim the middle. Now we just shim the other side. Now the top hinge is actually missing two screws. The manufacturer supplies two longer screws to go through the jam, through the shims, and into the structure. Now remember, the door came pre-bored for the lever and the deadbolt. Okay, that was nice and tight. Okay, now I'm going to spray some insulating foam around the opening. I'm using a minimal expanding foam because I don't want the jam to bow. Good swing, nice fit, and weather tight. And these fiberglass doors, you can stain them to look like wood, or you can paint them. Beautiful job. You know, I'll bet that homeowner really feels a difference. It's a big difference, Richard. With the insulation that we put around the outside of the jam and the weather stripping on the door, that's practically airtight. Absolutely. Tom, I can't imagine that old wooden door was very efficient. Well, here's a cross-section of a door that's similar to what we took out. Look at how thin the wood is on the panel where it meets the style and rails. And that's all that stands between you and Mother Nature. Very inefficient. Whereas the door we installed is really just one big slab of insulation. It's a foam core, and when it, even where the door is stamped, there's still foam under there, making it much more efficient. This door like this that we installed is probably double the efficiency of this door. Hmm. And no drafts. No drafts. All right, great story. Well, we'd love to hear from you if you've got problems with your house, so drop us a line. And until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Tom Silva. I'm Rich Prithui. And I'm Roger Cook. For Ask This Old House. Hey, you need a little door? A little one? <laughs> Pizza door? If you have a question about your house or a home improvement if you'd like to share, please let us know. Visit our website at pbs.org for expert advice, step-by-step -step videos, and much more.
first time on Ask This Old House. You guys ready to play some golf? Yeah. All right, give it a ride. We roll out an entire episode of fun projects to do with your kids. It promises to be a real blast. <laughs> this Old House magazine, the companion to the television series, provides advice from our experts that you've come to know. You can use your credit card to order 10 monthly issues for $10 by calling 1-800-221-5900.